Good to see y'all this morning. We're in Deuteronomy chapter 33. We might finish this book out today. We'll see. And this is uh, Moses' blessings upon the children of Israel. Verse 1 says, And this is the blessing wherewith Moses, the man of God, blessed the children of Israel before his death. And he said, The Lord came from Sinai and rose up from Seir unto them. He shined forth from Mount Paran, was Paran, and he came with ten thousand of saints from his right hand when a fiery law for them. Yea, he loved the people. All his saints are in thy hand, and they sat down at thy feet. Every one shall receive of thy words. Moses commanded us a law, even the inheritance of the congregation of Jacob. And he was king in Yeshurun. And last week we brought out Yeshurun is the title of an upright Israel, the, the Israel that God's looking for, upright. Um, when the heads of the people and the tribes of Israel were gathered together. Now these blessings, you can go to Genesis chapter 49 and you can see parallels to these blessings that Jacob put upon his sons. Um, verse 6 is a blessing to Reuben. It says, let Reuben live and not die and uh, let not his men be few. So he wants to give him, he wants him to have a long life and have a lot of men for uh, battle and for uh, the prosperity of the land. In verses uh, 7, it says, And this is the blessing of Judah. And he said, Hear, Lord, the voice of Judah, and bring him in unto his people. Let his hands be sufficient for him, and be thou a help to him from his enemies. So he's asking that uh, the Lord hear Judah's prayers, and in battle let him be brought back home, and let what he has always be sufficient to defend the tribe, and not let his enemies ever prevail over him. That's basically what that's saying. I did a lot of research on that to find out. Because some of these phrases, they don't, we don't understand them. Um, but that's it in a nutshell on verse 7. And you can find a parallel to it in Genesis 49, verses 8 through 12, if you ever want to go back and see what Jacob's blessing was. Verse 8 is unto the tribe of Levi, and it's in Genesis 49 and 5. It um, says, And of the Levi, he said, Let the Thummim and the Urim be with thy holy one. The Thummim and the Urim was devices used to help understand what the will of God was for the high priest. And the holy one here is the high priest. Um... A pretty interesting fact is not everybody in the tribe of Levi could become a priest. You had to be of the sons of Aaron to become a priest. You could work in the temple in the tribe of Levi, but to be a priest, you had to be of the tribe of Aaron. And I think I've ran across that once before, but I may not have paid much attention to it. Um, I just can't remember. Whom thou didst prove at uh, Massa, and with whom thou didst strive at the waters of Meribah, who said unto his father and to his mother, I have not seen him, neither did he acknowledge his brethren, nor knew his own children, for they have observed thy word and kept thy covenant. Well, on the surface, that don't mean a great deal, but if you look in Exodus chapter 32, verses 26 through 28, and Numbers 25, verses 7 through 9, it shows you uh, 
that the priests and the Levites put God first, uh, even unto killing their own brethren that had sinned against God. They put him first. What God said went. It didn't matter if his mother, father, brother, children, if they sinned against God, they would take care of business. Exodus 32, 26 and 28. Yes, sir. Right. Yeah. So that's where our love's supposed to be. We're supposed to have God above all others. Boy, how I fail at that sometimes. Let's see, verse 10, it says, And they shall teach Jacob thy judgments, and Israel thy law. They shall put incense before thee, and hold burnt sacrifice upon thy altar. Bless, Lord, his substance, and accept the work of his hands. Smite through the loins of them that rise against him, and of them that hate him, they, that they rise not again. So he's asking that the Lord keep uh, the Levites in the place where they need to be to do the will of God. And if they have enemies, smite them till they can't rise up again. Pretty straightforward. Um, let's see here. Verse 12. This is the blessing unto Benjamin. You can find it in Genesis 49, verse 27. And if Benjamin, he said, the beloved of the Lord, shall dwell safely by him, and the Lord shall cover him all the day long, and he shall dwell between his shoulders. Well, the, the property that Benjamin inherited uh, is where Mount Moriah was located, which is where the temple was built eventually. Um, so all that land belonged to the tribe of Benjamin. So God was overlooking them all the time from the temple, which I thought was pretty interesting. And uh, dwell between his shoulders. It took me a while to find that phrase, but it's a phrase that shows a, a way of being supported by God as a father would support his child. But that phrase is so obscure that what does it mean when you read it you know he shall dwell between his shoulders but to those people it was symbolic of a father carrying his son through life um, I like that verses 13 through 17 are the blessings of Joseph and they from a worldly point of view, maybe the best batch of blessings there. And you can read about that in Genesis 49, verses 20 through, 22 through 26. Um, and we read these, these are just short things, but when you start processing in your mind what these blessings mean to these people, um, well, let's just read Joseph's here. It says, And of Joseph, he said, Blessed of the Lord, be his land. For the precious things of heaven, precious things of heaven, that would be rain, sun, crops grow. I mean, if your crops didn't produce, there was no Walmart or Food City. You went hungry. You know, so, except, uh, let's see, I've done lost it here. For the precious things of heaven, for the dew, and for the, uh, and for the deep that coucheth beneath, so water from below, and for the precious fruits brought forth by the sun, and for the precious things put forth by the moon, and for the chief things of the ancient mountains, and for the precious things of the lasting hills, for the precious things of the earth and fullness thereof, and for the goodwill of him that dwelt in the high bush, dwelt in the bush. Huh. Let the blessing come upon the head of Joseph 
and upon the top of the head of him that was separated from his brethren. His glory is like the firstling of his bullock, and his horns are like the horns of unicorns. With them he shall push people together to the ends of the earth, and they are the ten thousands of Ephraim, and they are the thousands of Manasseh. Okay. This could probably be the best blessing upon the twelve tribes. Um, I want you to look in verse 16. It says, And for the precious things of the earth, and fullness thereof, and for the good will of him that dwelleth in the bush. Well, who dwelt in the bush? God spoke to Moses out of a burning bush. These people hadn't forgot any of that. And they haven't forgotten it till this day. That who dwelt in the bush. So they're wanting the blessings of God. Let the blessings come upon the head of Joseph. And upon the top of the head of him that was separated from his brethren. And if you'll remember, his, his brother sold him off. You know, I mean, that was God's will, but he was separated out, sold off, went to Egypt, learned a lot, was persecuted, thrown in prison, but eventually became second in power in all the land of Egypt. And because of that, he saved the nation of Israel from a great famine. So he's asking that this tribe of Benjamin be separated out by God. I mean, this tribe of Joseph, just like Joseph was, to receive those special blessings. And I think the blessings of Joseph here is probably some of the best of the lot. Um, hey, I'll take the, the blessings of the one that dwelt in the bush any day of the week. All right. Verse 18, and of Zebulun, he said, Rejoice, Zebulun, in thy going out, and Issachar, in thy tents. They shall call the people unto the mountain, there they shall offer sacrifices of righteousness, for they shall suck of the abundance of the seas and of treasures hid in the sand. And in history, we look back, that's, these people were a seafaring people. They, uh, pulled a lot of wealth from trade on the oceans. But the, and of treasures hid in the sand. When we think of treasures hid in the sand, we're thinking about old pirate movies or something. But I did some research into it, and they used sand to produce glass. And glass in the Old Testament was a big thing. Ah, uh, is it Proverbs? No, it might be in Job. Job, somewhere in chapter 28, it compares the value of glass to the value of gold. And those don't compare to the value of wisdom, according to the book. So they used glass, I mean used sand to make glass, which was very valuable. Verses 20 and 21 are blessings upon the tribe of Gad. You can read about that in uh, Genesis 4 and, I mean, 49 and 19. So, and of Gad, he said, Blessed be he that enlarges Gad. He dwelleth as a lion and teareth the arm of the crown of the head with the crown of the head. Hmm. And he proved the first part for himself because there was a in a portion of the lawgiver was he seated, and he came with heads of the people. He executed the justice of the Lord, and his judgment was with Israel. And you can, you can expand upon these if you go to uh, Joshua 13 and 10, and Numbers 32 and 16. Um... But that part where it says, Tareth the arm with the crown of the head means to have victory over your enemies. I don't know what all these phrases are called, but some of them are pretty obscure and hard to find. Verse 
Verse 22 is for the tribe of Dan. Read it about the parallel to that in Genesis 49 and 16. It said, and of Dan, he said, Dan is a lion's whelp. He will leap from Bashan. Well, if you read on Dan, he started out pretty weak. But he grows stronger. And he's not satisfied with the lands that he has. So he moves north. And you read about that in Joshua 19, 47 and 48. And cuts himself out a bigger land. So he starts out as a lion's whelp. He can't provide for himself. But he grows strong enough to uh, become a lion and uh, leap from Bashan, which is the, the symbology of these is lost on us, or it's lost on me till I find something that references it. But I just think it's uh, so prophetic. I mean, God's told them all through this book, if you'll do this, I'll bless you, and if you don't, I won't. And then he goes over there and tells Moses, you know, they're not going to do what I ask. And then Moses tells them, you're not going to do what the Lord asks, but if you will, this is set before you. It's all prophetic. Uh, verse 23 is blessings for Naphtali. Naphtali. And it's in Genesis 49 and 21. It said of Naphtali, he said, O Naphtali, satisfied with favor and full with the blessings of the Lord. Possess thou the west and the south. So this tribe was satisfied with what they got. Um, they were full from the blessings of the Lord. And where their, their inheritance was, or their property was, was to, uh, next to the lakes of Merom and Galilee. And it says it's still some of the best lakes in the land of Israel to this day. Um, so they were satisfied. Verse 24 deals with the blessings of uh, Asher. And of Asher, he said, let Asher be blessed with children. Let him be acceptable to his brethren. Let him dip his foot in oil. So he wants him to have a lot of children. Um, he wants them to be acceptable amongst all their brethren. And let him dip his foot in oil. So I looked that up. And what that is is a reference to that his wine presses that you treaded by foot, I mean his olive presses that you treaded by foot would be plentiful. So as he treaded it, he would be dipping his foot in oil. Just interesting to me. And 25 through 29 are blessings to all of Israel. Uh, it says, Thy shoes shall be iron and brass, and as thy days, so shall thy strength be. So they're going to be fighting a lot for the first while anyway. But if you look back through history, they've been fighting from now all the way back to then. They've been fighting. There is none like unto the God of Jeshurun, who rideth upon the heaven in thy help, and in his excellency on the sky. The eternal God is thy refuge, and underneath are the everlasting arms. And he shall thrust out the enemy from before thee, and shall say, Destroy them. Israel then shall dwell in safety alone. The fountain of Jacob shall be upon a land of corn and wine. Also his heaven shall uh, drop down dew. Happy art thou, O Israel, who is like unto thee, O people saved by the Lord, the shield of thy help, and who is the sword of thy excellency? And thine enemies shall be found liars unto thee, and, and thou shalt tread upon their high places. And that's what Moses is blessing upon the children of Israel. He is that's what he hopes for them, but he knows they're probably not going to do that. And they did that for... They did pretty good for about 400 years. Then they fell off because when Joshua took up the mantle, what the good Lord said went. He did it. Anybody got any comments or questions before we start the next chapter? Yeah. 
Oh yeah, uh, olive oil was a symbol of wealth. Um, <laughs> you know, at times water was not readily available. So they would take that oil and rub themselves down with it and take a pottery shard and scrape it off. And that's how they would cleanse themselves if they didn't have any water. Um, you know, we're so used to having running water that think about what life would be like with no running water if you had to carry it for a few miles, you know. Um, we probably wouldn't waste as much. But if you look, water, potable water is quickly becoming uh, a commodity. Um, I don't know if you've seen it or not, but we've been selling water out of the Great Lakes to the Chinese. They come in and suck up tankers full of it and take it back over there because a lot of their water is poisoned. They poison their environment. You know, um, I remember, I might have been me and Brother Fred or me and Brother Dub talking, but it's been a few winters ago and I was standing there looking outside and the snow's flying and I run me a glass of water and I drank it and I was like, whoa, thank you Lord that I didn't have to walk uh, a mile to the creek and get me a drink of water. Because you can't just dig a well anywhere. Um, <clears throat> yeah, we're spoiled. Well, you just think about how everything is in so much control. Like, you saw Kentucky just got washed away, and they're probably getting ready to again. And I watched this meteorologist, and I can't remember the length of time that it was, but they got 10 inches of rain in this amount of time. And he said it because it was in the valleys, he said if that was in the flatland, that would be equal to getting 25 inches of rain in the same amount of time. I don't know if y'all seen Vegas got washed away the other day. Yeah, washed away. They was stuff floating through there and the casinos was flooded. And, uh, <laughs> uh, then uh, Southwest Virginia got washed away, you know. You know that might be a wake up call for boating in a casino. I don't know that, you know. But one of my customers lived in Swords Creek and he said, man, I kept hearing this noise about three in the morning. He said, I went outside and opened the door and there was water. He said, a car floated by. He said, then another car and another car. He said, then a house was floating down the street. I was like, well, were you okay? He said, well, when I built my house, I put it three blocks higher than all the other houses. And that, that, was, that was my saving grace. He said, but I still got to replace all my insulation. So remember those people in prayer, bless their hearts. Um, all right, let's hit verse, I mean, chapter 34. It says, And Moses went up from the plains of Moab under the mountains of Nebo to the top of Pisgah, that is over against Jericho. You know, every time I read Pisgah on the Blue Ridge Parkway, there's a place called Mount Pisgah. And there's a little restaurant up there. And we'll sit there, and I can't help but think about Moses when we're sitting there. You know, it's just... And it's usually, it's so high, it's usually in the clouds. It always looks like fog when you ride your motorcycle up there. It's like taking a shower. And it's over against Jericho, and the Lord showed him all the land of Gilead unto Dan, and all Naphtali, and the land of Ephraim, and Manasseh, and all the land of Judah under the utmost sea. Now, that's a lot of property. Did God show him that through the Spirit? I don't know. You know, I mean, his eye can't see that far, I don't believe. And the south and the plain of the valley of Jericho, the city of palm trees unto Zoar. And the Lord said unto him, This is the land which I swear unto Abraham, unto Isaac, and unto Jacob, saying, I will give unto thy seed, I have caused thee to see it with thine eyes, but thou shalt not go over thither. And the reason Moses didn't get to go over thither, thither <laughs> we read about last week, and instead of speaking to the rock, 
He smote it because he was angry with the people, children of Israel, not God. And Sally and some other people told me I needed to explain that a little better. So I'm going to try. The first go around that the people were looking for water, God told Moses to smoke, to smite it. Hit the rock and water came forth. Okay? When Jesus hung on the cross, he was smitten once and for all. And when that, it's symbolic of Christ. That rock is symbolic of Christ. When that uh, centurion poked his spear in Jesus' side, it says water and blood issued forth. That rock in the wilderness that the water came out of, that life-saving water, because the people were thirsting to death, was symbolic of Christ, okay? Well, if we go to the second incident where God told him to speak to the rock, that's symbolic of Christ too, all right? The first go around, he smote him because he had to be. He was smitten once and for all, for us, for all. But after he was smitten, that rent that veil in the temple in the midst so that you had access to the holies of holies and you didn't have to do anything special. You just had to speak to the rock to get that water. See how symbolic that is? I mean, that's just poetry, you know? It's just so symbolic. And you know, some scholars go on to the fact that Moses uh, hitting the rock the second time was trying to bring forth the second advent, blah, blah, blah. I, whatever, that's a bunch of, here's, uh, you know, that's a bunch of conjecture. But that is symbolic of Christ. Before, we didn't have easy access through the throne. Because of his sacrifice made on the cross, we have easy access to the throne room. Um, so I hope that puts that into a little bit better perspective because so I said, you didn't explain that good enough. <laughs> so where are we at here? Verse 5. And Moses, so Moses, the servant of the Lord, died there in the land of Moab uh, according to the word of the Lord. And Moses, the servant of the Lord, is used 18 times in this book. And he buried him in a valley in the land of Moab, over against Beth Peor. But no man knoweth of his sepulcher unto this day. Go over to Jude 9. I think Brother Raymond was there not too long ago. Jude verse 9. It says, yet Michael the archangel, when contending with the devil, he disputed about the body of Moses. Does not bring him railing accusation, but said, the Lord rebuke thee. What did the devil want with Moses' body? You know, at this point in history when Moses died, death was the realm of the devil. Okay? And this is all conjecture too, this stuff in my mind, but if he could have got that body and resurrected it, he'd have had him a fine figurehead to lead a whole lot of people astray. Was that the point? I don't know. Um, but I, I just want you to see Michael's humility right here. He's content, you know, Michael is an archangel, very powerful dignitary. But there is a pecking order everywhere. And he's telling, Michael's telling the devil, he's like, it's not up to me to tell you. I'm, I'm just doing what I'm told. If you want, take it up with the boss. You know, and Michael probably had the authority to do something there. But it wasn't his place. God wanted Moses' body for whatever reason. Um... If you go to Matthew chapter 17. Matthew chapter 17, it says, After six days, Jesus taketh Peter, James, and John, that's the inner circle there, his brother, and bringeth them up into the high mountain apart. 
and was transfigured before them, and his face did shine as the sun, and his raiment was white as light. And behold, there appeared unto them Moses and Elijah, Elias, talking with him. Then answered Peter and said unto Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If thou wilt, let us make here three tabernacles, one for thee, one for Moses, one for Elias. <laughs> While he yet spake, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them. Behold, a voice out of the cloud which said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. And when the disciples heard it, they fell on their face and were sore afraid. Jesus came and touched them and said, Arise and be not afraid. So, Moses is back on the scene here. God wasn't done with him. What's he doing with him? I don't know. But he's back here. And this is before a resurrection body. Christ hasn't been crucified yet. So that's not Moses or Elijah's resurrected body. Just another mystery. Because I don't know the answer. But it fascinates me that it's there. Yes, sir. Right. But, you know, when Christ was hanging on the cross, it says he was surrounded by the bulls of Bashan, which are demons. Nobody else saw him. So when Christ was hanging on the cross, where else was he? Time and space mean nothing to our God. He can be in all places at all times. Now, the word Okaterian is only used in this book twice. Once when the uh, uh, angels gave up their first estate, their first habitation, is called Okaterian, which is, means glorified body. And the other refers to us when we get our glorified body. Okay? And apparently space and time has no control over its glorified body. Just something to look forward to because I can't explain it. You know, when space and time don't mean nothing. You can step out of this reality into another. Hey, I don't know how all that works, but I'm looking forward to it. <laughs> so being here in Matthew 17, God apparently wasn't done with Moses from Deuteronomy here, so he brings him back and talks to Jesus. What they talked about, I don't know, but it, it's in there for a reason. Okay, verse 6, it says, And he buried him. Who buried him? God buried him in the valley in the land of Moab over against Beth Peor. But no man knoweth of his sepulcher unto this day. And as long as this word stands, nobody will know where that sepulcher is, is because it says unto this day. And it says this word will last forever. So, hey, we'll never know where that sepulcher's at. <laughs> It says, Moses was 120 years old when he died. His eye was not dim, nor his natural force abated. When I think of that, I think of natural strength. But that is not what it meant. It meant energy and, and enthusiasm for serving God had not abated. 120 years old. Spent the first 40 years of his life learning and becoming a man. Spent the next 40 as a shepherd in the wilderness till God called him from... <laughs> The one that dwelt in the bush called him into service, and he, spent the, and he spent the next 40 years dealing with a bunch of whiners. <laughs> bless his heart. You know, bless his heart. But, you know, he was the youngest of uh, his brethren, um, of his kindred. Let's see here. Levi, his great-great-grandfather, lived to be 137 his great-grandfather Kohath lived to be 133. His father Amram lived to be 137. And Aaron, his older brother, lived to be 123. And somewhere I've seen a reference to his sister lived to be 126. But I didn't write it down, so don't take my word for it. So his eyesight was not dim, and his natural force not abated. So his energy and enthusiasm for serving God 
was not diminished. Boy, I wish I could say that all the time. There's some days it ain't so enthusiastic. That is, I hate to say it. And the children of Israel wept for Moses in the plains of Moab 30 days. So the days of weeping and mourning for Moses were ended. And Joshua the son of Nun was full of the spirit of wisdom. For Moses had laid his hands upon him. And the children of Israel hearkened unto him and, and did as the Lord commanded Moses. And there arose not a prophet, not a prophet since in Israel like unto Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face. Now you think about that. Man, he got to spend some real time with God. And there's times in the Bible here that they kind of chide each other, you know. Um, Moses is mad at Israel, but God goes to intervene, and Moses steps up and says, no, Lord, don't do this. And the Lord says, no, I'll just take, wipe them out and start over with you. Well, I, he wasn't going to do that, but just look at it from that. I mean, Moses could ask questions that mm, I, I wouldn't be asking, you know, but they had that relationship, that, and, and that was with the God of the universe. I just can't imagine. Face to face. And that face to face don't mean it like we think. You know, it's in, the book says it's impossible to look upon the glory of the Lord. Um, I believe there's a spot in Psalms that says that the hem of his garment filled the temple with glory. The hem of his garment. You know, it, it, it said the flesh cannot look upon the glory of God. And, you know, Moses asked him at one point. And he said, nah, no, but you can look on my hinder parts. So he put his hand over him in the cleft of a rock, and as he walked by, he observed his hinder parts. I mean, that's as close as Moses could get. And, uh, yeah, face to face. And all the signs and the wonders which the Lord sent him to do in the land of Egypt to Pharaoh, to all his servants, and to all his land. And in all that mighty hand, and in all the great terror which Moses showed in the sight of Israel. And that concludes the book of Deuteronomy. Are you not glad that you have Jesus as a mediator? <laughs> I am. I mean... There was a lot of immediate judgments pushed out here. You messed up and you died then. Yeah, he was just not as good. Well, you know, I'm, I'm not saying that as a hack. I'm just saying you go to Hebrews and you... Right. And I don't know if y'all can hear Brother Tony, but he's saying that Moses was a type of Christ in, in his mediation between God and Israel. And if y'all remember at one point, God gathered Israel together and had them present themselves. And he come out in a cloud of fire on this mountain. And they're saying, no, 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 you talk to him. We'll go back over here. You know, we're going back to the house. We don't, we don't want to be here. And... So, yeah, he was a type of Christ, just like in the home, the mother is a type of Christ. She's a mediator between the father and the child. Um, my mom has probably restrained my dad more than once. <laughs> Anybody else got anything? All right. We'll wait and see what the preacher's got for us.